Many of you remember the comedian Jack Benny. He had a pretty good reputation as an inflexible tightwad. So one day, on a, in a skit on his radio show, a would-be robber stopped him on the street, poked a gun into his ribs and said, your money or your life. And after a long pause and a few more jabs to the ribs, Benny quipped, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. <laughs> Why is the common word on the street that the church has such a hard time talking about money? I spent the whole week over there in the flea market, so I know Desert Skies people love to talk about money. And more than half of Jesus' teachings, including his parables, are about money and giving and riches and what to do with it. And finance team, man, they talk about it every time we meet. So as individuals, even we are faced with money choices every day when we shop, we give gifts to people we love, we pay for those things in life that we may call bills, but which also make possible the things in life that are important to us. And in his teachings on money, Jesus' bottom line question might well be, your money or your life? So what are we thinking? I mean, could we set aside for today at least the stigma of talking about money in church and just have some fun with it? Because as we continue to look at our membership vows, we're going to encounter those kinds of conversations. So we look at our vows and we look at stewardship and pledges and budgets and dreams and visions, all those things that we talk about this time of year. And then I'm reminded of the story of two men who were marooned on an island. One man was pacing back and forth, worried and scared, while the other man just sat back and was sunning himself. And the first man said to the second man, aren't you afraid that we're about to die? Well, no, said the second man. I make $10,000 a week and tithe faithfully to my church every week. It's stewardship month at my church. My pastor will find me. <laughs> now there's a line. <laughs> and it's one that maybe Zacchaeus in our story may have been hoping for as well. So we read that Jesus, near the end of his journey to Jerusalem, is passing through this border town of Jericho. And in this town is this man named Zacchaeus, who is not just a tax collector, but a ruler of tax collectors, which means, as Luke's gospel explains, that he is rich and most likely dishonest. He wants to see Jesus. He's heard about Jesus. He has begun to turn his life around because of the message that he has heard, but because he's so short, he can't see over the crowd, so he climbs a tree. Or in Finn's version, he jumps up the tree, which I really like that image as well. And so when Jesus arrives at the place where Zacchaeus has perched himself, he finds him. He calls him down and he invites himself to lunch, which simultaneous bring, simultaneously brings Zacchaeus great joy, but it also scandalizes the crowd because they know that Zacchaeus is a sinner, a sellout tax collector to Rome. Now, we all know that term selling out, it's a term that's used to describe someone's actions not aligning with what they say they value or believe in. And during the Roman Empire, many persons who acquired material wealth may have done so by cooperating with the Roman authorities and therefore contributing to the systemic oppression of the poor. Well, now Christians are called as this countercultural movement that's concerned with a more equitable distribution of resources and care for and help for those who needed it the most. Almost nothing was worse to them than a despised 
tax collector. But friends, we have to be really careful because that doesn't mean that those who had money weren't absolutely critical to the Christian movement. Benefactors in, in, um, were essential to the spread of Christianity and the support of the teachers and the apostles. And we read about many of these benefactors, most of whom were women. So money then, as well as now, when coupled with alignment of values and vision for a more just world, really can be used as a way to bring glory to God as well as helping to build God's kingdom on earth. So this Zacchaeus story, it's an important one because it shows a shift in financial priority after one has an encounter with Jesus. It shows what can happen to a sellout when they're faced with unconditional love and grace. Because what happens to people when they profoundly experience the grace of God? Men and women who, by the Holy Spirit of God, became aware of their weakness, became aware of their brokenness, became aware of their own need for help, and found God, despite their weaknesses, their brokenness, to be near, to be loving, to be gracious, to be patient. And when that happens, something indeed happens in our hearts it happens deep within our guts, and everything changes. That's when we begin to live our lives in this type of open-handed generosity where we see that all that we have and all that we are has actually been given to us by God for the glory of God. And when we begin to see ourselves as owners of nothing, but rather stewards of all things that have been entrusted to us so that grace is made visible through us and the way we live our lives and the way we use our resources, we discover that comes most generously and most frequently via the generosity of the people of God. The Bible makes it really clear that God calls us to order our financial lives around our commitment to Christ. We call that biblical stewardship. And getting our financial lives in order takes time and intention and knowledge of wise financial practices. It takes a plan. It takes effective tools to follow that plan. It's not only, friends, about giving to the church so that God's plans can be fulfilled here. It also involves getting our own individual financial lives in order. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, once said, It is true, riches and the increase of them are the gift of God. Yet great care is to be taken that what is intended for a blessing does not turn into a curse. So with that in mind, um, there is a fairly well-tested plan that helps people get their financial lives in order using the 10-10-80 principle. Now, I learned that growing up. Anyone else have an idea of what I might? Yeah, okay, a few of us. Um, maybe, so that's, you give the first 10% to God. You give the next 10% to saving for your own future. And then you live on 80% of your income. You see, God doesn't want anything to own us. And so the wisdom goes that moving toward and growing into this sort of 10, 10, 80 living helps us to rely on God and establish healthy priorities for the way we deal with our own money. So for some of us, uh, the spiritual discipline of intentional giving is new. Maybe we even want to know where to start. And so my suggestion is just start somewhere. Pray about it. Uh, Listen to what God is calling you to give, but start somewhere. Please don't put it off until you can afford it. God will guide you in the process as you pray about your decision. So here are four practical steps that you can follow. Number one is to start by assessing where you are. Determine the percentage of income that you give away currently and start from there. 
For instance, if you make $50,000 a year and you give $500 to your faith community, you are giving 1% of your income. So then, number two, review your income and expenses and priorities. Explore how your budget reflects the priorities in your life, asking, does the way you use your money bear witness to the things that you think are most important to you? Then number three, pick a percentage and determine to give to God a percentage of what God has given to you. Many people start with that one or two or three percent of their income and grow toward a goal of tithing, which is a full 10 percent. But whatever percentage God directs you to give, determine to give that percentage right off the top, which brings us to step number four. Make your gift to God a first fruits offering. Decide the percentage that you're going to give every time you receive income, whether it goes into the bank or directly into your hand. Give it right when you get paid. And that's a first fairly radical step because it actually makes you think about what you have been given and how you're going to give back. Give to God at those times when God has given you something. Tony Campolo, who's quite a well-known Christian evangelist, tells of being invited to speak at a ladies' meeting. There were 300 women there, and before he spoke, the president of the organization read a letter from a missionary. It was a very moving letter, and in that letter, the missionary expressed a need for $4,000 to take care of an emergency that had cropped up. So the president of the organization said, we all need to pray that God will provide the resources to meet the need of this missionary. Brother Campolo, will you please pray for us? Well, Tony Campolo, who is very outspoken, flat out said, no. Well, pretty startled, she said, I beg your pardon? And he said, no, I won't pray for that. He said, I believe that God has already provided the resources and that all we need to do is give. Tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to step up to this table and give every bit of cash I have in my pocket. And if all of you will do the same thing, I think that God has already provided the resources. Well, the president of the organization chuckled a little bit and said, well, I guess we all got the point. He's trying to teach us that all need to give sacrificially. And he said, no, that is not what I am trying to teach you. I'm trying to teach you that God has already provided for this missionary. All we need to do is give it. So here, I'm going to put down all of my money that I have with me. He writes in this story, I only had $15 in my pockets, so I wasn't too worried about breaking the bank, but he put down his $15, and then he looked at the president of the organization. Marilyn, where are you? I'm thinking. Reluctantly, she opened her purse, took out all of her money, which is about $40, and put it on the table. And one by one, the rest of the ladies filed by and put their money on the table. And when the money was counted, they had collected just over $4,000. Tony Campolo said, now here's the lesson. God always supplies for our needs. God supplied for this missionary too. The only problem was we were keeping it for ourselves. Now, let's pray and thank God for God's provision. Friends, there's a reason why money is so important in the conversation about faithfulness and why the story of Zacchaeus is such a good one. Because when we're sold on Jesus, when we believe his message about grace and community and forgiveness and welcome, we find ways to support the work of our church. 
the resources that we need to do everything, everything that we feel God calling us to do right here at Desert Skies, they're already here. We just need to put them on the table. Friends, ministry costs money. No matter how faithful we may be or how many hours we volunteer in and out of the church or how hard we work at the other four parts of our membership vows, how hard we pray, how often we're here, how much we serve, and how many people we tell about the church, ministry itself still takes money. And the mission and ministry that we can accomplish here at Desert Skies depends on our generosity and on our giving on top of everything else we do. And I can promise you, because I have seen it, because of your faithfulness, lives are being changed. People are being blessed. Outcasts are being loved. You see, there are no outside organizations funding our building or our salaries or our ministries or missions or anything else here at Desert Skies except currently our Vail campus. No, it's done by all of us, sacrificing our income together. So intentional giving, percentage giving, I find that this is an extremely brilliant plan of God to enable God's kingdom to grow. And I invite you, as you think this coming week, about the pledges that you will present next Sunday during our Pledge Sunday, that you'll consider percentage giving for the work of ministry here in the year 2020. Your church council leaders and the annual conference giving to the Vail Campus have already pledged $109,992 to get us started. They believe in the vision of this church. And I'm guessing that next Sunday will be an absolutely glorious day. Amen.